Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bridge. Let's stand on our feet and worship together.
this broken world. Thank you that you are that mighty fortress, that refuge in which we can run to. We worship you, God. In your name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. So if you turn in your Bible uh, to Jude, if you were here with us last week, we deviated from our series uh, just to do a message that, that, that conveyed the idea that praise God we're here, but our work is not done. And I just want to remind you, we have this light 
on our stage. We've had it on our stage since 2018 as a reminder uh, that as long as that light is off, that means no one came to Christ through a ministry of Bridge Bible Church, a family member didn't come to Christ, and no one came to Christ through us sharing the gospel. And so this is a visible reminder when you show up at church every Sunday that the Lord is not done with us. He has more for us to do. And then when we see the light on, we get excited. We say, God did something, and he's going to do it again as long as we are faithful. So, so remember that. And if you missed that message and you're part of our church family, please go back and hear that. The challenge is, is to move forward and, and to, to leave a spiritual legacy. But we, we started the series two weeks before that called Contend and Defend. We're in the book of Jude. And, and week one, we, we started with this idea. The sermon was called State of Emergency because in the world today, in the church today, there's a state of emergency because there is a lot of false teaching infiltrating the modern church. And here's what happens when you try to address that, you you get bombarded with the message of our culture when they say things like, well, you're not loving. You need to be more tolerant. You need to accept this. Love the sin or hate the sin. Well, Well, the Bible doesn't say love false teachers. And we shared this quote that said, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing are dangerous, but shepherds or wolves in shepherd's clothing are deadly. They will tear you apart, they will destroy your belief, and they will condemn you to hell because you miss the gospel. And when we think about uh, the, increase, the increase of deception in the world today, uh, we, we moved on in that series uh, to learn lessons from the past. And there's really complicated verses where it talked about unbelieving Israel, part of God's chosen people. Think of that as church-going folks today that, that, that are part of the family. They show up every week. Maybe they even give to the church, but they haven't believed the gospel, and God destroyed them for their unbelief. Now, it happened a little bit differently back then than it would happen today. First of all, those people saw amazing miracles. The Red Sea parted, the 10 plagues being led by a pillar of fire at night, pillar of smoke by day, and they started to grumble against God because they did not trust the goodness of God. Then we saw rebellious angels. We we know that there was probably two falls. We we know that the first fall was when they became prideful and and they they sinned against God, they rebelled. And then there was a second rebellion where they, they left their station as angels, like crossed some boundary that they weren't supposed to cross. And God dealt with them severely, putting them in gloomy change. And then finally, we saw how God destroyed the the immoral Sodom and Gomorrah. And and our goal as we contend uh, for the faith is to see the unbelieving find belief, to see the rebellious uh, stop rebelling and become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And, And also, we hope, too, that the immoral will repent. That is our goal, not to condemn, but to see life change. And like I said, when we read these verses, some people are like, I don't want to talk about those. Those are confusing. Or, or, or they seem negative. Why do we have to be so negative? Can't we just hold hands, sing kumbaya, and, and just say, God is love and be done? Well, I'm sorry, but, but here's the deal. We have the opportunity as Christians to serve as God's servants and as God's messengers, but not as his editors. We don't have the right to take a passage of Scripture and say, well, I don't like that. Take that out. Can you imagine giving your kid a list of instructions? And the kid's like, I'll do this, I'll do this, but clean the bathroom, not doing that. Yeah, I made the mess, but I don't care what mom and dad said. I'm not doing that. Well, God doesn't work that way. And so the question is, as we're reading this and as we're studying this, um, do, do we approach a text like Jude and get angry at all the false teachers out there? Or, or do we try to look at it with different lenses? Let me give you a different picture before we get into this. Imagine you have a little kid that you love running into traffic, and they're going to get hit by a car on a busy road. You say, oh, Johnny, please come back. Please, you don't want to get hit. No, you say, no, Johnny, come back. Or, or if you're not a parent and you're, you're a teen, think about your best friend heading unknowingly into harm's way. You say, oh, don't do that. Or you're in the car next to them, and they're about to pull out in front of another car. Oh, just wait. They're not going to, they might not heed the warning. You say, stop! Bad things are coming. See, the Bible gives us warnings in a tone that's designed to help us the severity of the danger ahead. And, and, And a lot of times we don't take those warnings very seriously. See, God wants to warn us of the dangers of sin, false teaching, demons, and hell. And anyone correcting false teaching, they're saying, oh, you're divisive. No, the Bible talks about the false teachers as being divisive, not the ones correcting it. 
And, and one thing we got to keep in mind is, as a motivation to share our faith, hell's hot, forever's a long time. We, we want to help people. That, that, that is not a place we want to see anyone end up. And so we need to remember false teaching and false religions, not, they, they destroy the soul. And it's something we need to be worried about. See, when it comes to false teaching, God doesn't play, and neither should we. He does not play around. He does not take it lightly. He, he doesn't say, oh, it, it's okay, just, just love people and you'll get over it. No, there's a very, very specific gospel, and we don't want to corrupt it, pervert it, or embrace teachers that do that. So that, let's move into the text. We got eight verses, uh, verses 8 through 16. Uh, if you missed the previous uh, two sermons on this, I believe they're online. Uh, I believe our app is now approved and, and working. We, we switched companies. Uh, and, and just keep an eye on that app because we're going to be updating it uh, as we go. So we're picking up in the verse 8. It says, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. In verse 9, another crazy story. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed, but all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Verse 11, woe to them, it's a pronouncement of judgment. For they walk in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. They're wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all of the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud, mouth mouth Loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. What a tongue twister that text is. You see, ungodly in there like seven times in one verse. I think, I think he's trying to make a point here. And, and so because this is a longer text, very complicated, what I want to do is I want to just do an overview, and I want to give you four takeaways, four truths that we see in these verses. And then I, I want to bring it to a focal point at the end. And so if you're looking for a deep, deeper Bible study on this, they, we, they have those available. I can get you a commentary. But I just want to walk you through some things that I want to make sure that you catch and take away. And here's the first one. False teachers show zero reverence for the truth. They have no reverence for the truth. They don't uphold the gospel. They don't uphold the scriptures. Now, now look at verse 8. It, you, you see this connecting phrase. It takes us back to all the things that we had read before, yet in like manner. And, and think about what we connected to in the previous verses. We're, we're, we're talking about unbelief, rebellion, and immorality, gross sin that displeases God. Think about that for a minute. They, 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 they're like those ones that rebelled. They're like those ones that are immoral. They're like those ones who did not believe and trust God's goodness. It says they choose their dreams over the truth. They're relying on dreams. How many times have you clicked on a video and there's these false teachers on there and, and they give you this vision they had in a dream and, and you compare what they said to what's in the Bible and you're like, that can't be true. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible never reveals that in a dream. And, and so we need to understand they're relying on their dreams, meaning they're phony visionaries. They're, they don't clearly see the future like they claim. They're false prophets. And, and the phrase is also complicated enough in the Greek to include not just their dreams, but their evil imaginations. How long is it before you see something and you're like, all right, I don't know, they seem okay. I want to take my time. And then all of a sudden the lid comes off and you're like, these folks are crazy. They don't believe the Bible. They're, they're following a cult leader. How many cult leaders have we had in our country? You think David Koresh, like, oh, they just, they just want to live together and have a calm, and then bad things happen, and then they all end up dying. 
or, or the guy that made him drink all the Kool-Aid and, and knew what he was doing. He, he was perverse and full of evil imaginations. It says they, they, defile, they defile the flesh or they literally contaminate their physical bodies. Now, Jude recognizes that the flesh is not the source of our contamination. That's the sinful nature. If you're here this morning, welcome to Bridge Bible Church. You're just like me. You're a sinner, and you need the grace of Jesus Christ in your life. So they're ones that defile the flesh. And, and if you pay attention long enough and you see these false teachers, how many scandals have there been in our country where there's sexual immorality or theft of some kind involved in the church? And, and so we want to be people that love Jesus, tell the truth, love people, and we go out there, and then we've got all this baggage that people have because they've seen all this stuff on the TV, on YouTube, on, on news channels, all these pastors and false prophets falling, getting into sin, defiling the flesh. We also see in the text they reject authority. They, and the way that's worded is that they're, they're taking an established authority and said, I'm not going to follow that. See, if you're a Christian and you're a pastor, if you're a Bible teacher, you are under authority. You're under the authority first of Jesus Christ, and we believe by proxy we're under the authority of his word. And then it says this complicated phrase, they blaspheme the glorious ones. They, they, they speak of spiritual things in a very casual or irreverent way. They don't, they don't have reverence for even God, his angels, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And we get to this example of where Moses is, our, or not Moses, but, but the Michael the archangel is arguing with Satan. And, and think about this for a moment. Michael the archangel, God's mightiest angel, the protector of God's people. We see in scripture in like uh, Daniel where this one angel was coming uh, with an answer to Daniel's prayer and, and this spiritual force known as the Prince of Persia resisted him and Michael the archangel stepped in so this angel could deliver this message to, to Daniel. So we know that Michael is a powerful angel and, and the devil is starting this argument with him and, and here's how he responds. He says, may the Lord rebuke you. One, recognizing God's sovereignty but also recognizing he, even in his angelic position, had to show reverence to Satan, who was the most powerful created spiritual being who rebelled against God. Compare that to today. I remember when uh, COVID-19 first happened, you had all these wingnut, whack job teachers showing up on TV saying they bind Satan, they command Satan, they command the virus, showing no reverence for spiritual things. And if you wanna to laugh today, go home, type Kenneth Copeland, COVID-19 rap. They took his whole rant, put it into a rap song, and it's actually pretty funny. And it's ridiculous. But what is our takeaway from that? We need to be a people that show reverence to God throughout our entire life and the way we worship. We worship in a certain way here at Bridge Bible Church because in our own way, in our own conscience, we're saying we want to show reverence to God in the way that we worship. And then the second part is we need to reject the teachers and leaders who don't. So if someone isn't showing reverence for, for things they don't understand, we need to reject those teachers. Now, here's what you got to do as a Christian at home. If you're a parent, you, you need to teach your kids to have reverence for God, reverence for the scripture, Reverence for a life of worship. If you're a kid, you need to model reverence to your friends and you need to not worry about what they think of you. How important is it to just be honest? What'd you do this week? Nothing. That's what so many, that's what I did. Or, you know, when I was a little older and I, I got to skip church on Sunday and play hockey, but listen, my parents were smart. They made me go Sunday night. I st still had to go. What'd you do this week? Oh, we had a hockey game. Oh, you didn't go to church? Oh, yeah, I did. And they caught me because they knew me well enough. But we need to be willing to say, hey, my life is lived in such a way to please God. We cannot let our faith become casual and irreverent. The second thing I want uh, you to walk away with today is that when it comes to false teachers, there's nothing new. There's nothing new. Look at verse 11 for a second. He pronounces judgment on the false teachers. He says, look, they walk in the way of Cain. They abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and they perished in Korah's rebellion. So there's three Old Testament reverence, references. So, so again, Jews writing to a predominantly Jewish Christian audience. He's using references that they would understand. And for the sake of time, uh, let's look at uh, just Cain, for exa example. If you want to check me on this when you go home today, look up Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Cain was born after the fall of Adam and Eve. 
He was their firstborn son. And here's what happened. Him and Abel are offering worship to God. Abel recognized that, hey, I got to have a blood sacrifice like God commanded. And God showed favoritism towards Abel because he kept the command of God. And then Cain decided, hey, I'm just going to give a portion of the things that I grow out of the ground. And what he was basically saying is, there's a new way to worship. You can worship your own way. This is Burger King worship. Have it your way right away. And here's what God said, no. And so he got jealous of Abel, got jealous of his blessing. How many of you have looked at someone else and you're like, they have got to do something wrong because God can't be that happy with them. They're cheating someone to get ahead. Well, that's a little bit like what came, he became jealous, he became angry, and his worship was rejected by God. And God even said, look, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to overcome you. It wants to overtake you. But do what is right and you'll be accepted. Well, Cain didn't do what is right. He decided to murder his brother, he became the first murderer in human history. In Numbers chapter 22 through 24, we see this character, Balaam. He, he was a prophet for hire. In other words, he was consumed by envy and greed. Again, the aforementioned Kenneth Copeland, he talks about being a billionaire openly with his congregation. It's like, how many of you are like, I got to stop giving to that church. They got money, they got planes. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, also to a modern example, more recent, there's a guy named Stephen Furtick, <clears throat> whose son wrote this rap song and it's full of immorality, bragging about his diamonds. It's like, how'd you buy those diamonds? Oh, through dad's money. Where did dad get his money? From the church. It's like, you guys are consumed with greed and envy and you're celebrating it. So many false prophets, when they tell you give so you can get blessed, that's a lie. They're trying to appeal to your greed because they're greedy. When you hear at Bridge Bible Church, we're gonna tell you to worship with your giving. Worship with your budget. It's not just enough that you decide what belongs to God. You need to decide it all belongs to God and you use every penny in ways that glorify God. You know, the way you budget, the way you buy food. You can't spend money on sinful things and say, I give to the church, it's okay. No, that's a contradiction. We want to glorify God. And then in Korah's rebellion, a whole bunch of people were destroyed and it's talked about in number 16. Korah was a cousin of Moses. He was a Levite. He wasn't chosen to be a priest and he became angry and prideful, rebelled against Moses. And so here's what God did. He opened up the earth and swallowed 250 people, killed them instantly. Over time, a group of people became sympathetic. Like, God, that was mean. You shouldn't have done that. And later, God killed 14,700 other Israelites with a plague. And that's in Numbers 16. See, pride and greed are very real temptations and have been since the Old Testament. What do we need to do with that? Well, we need to check our heart. We don't get to have it our way right away at church. We strive as a family to do it God's way. So what do we do with that? Well, we avoid those telling you there's new ways to worship. Okay, in our culture today, we have the freedom to gather. Hebrews 10.25 says, don't give up on meeting together. When someone says to you, oh, we got a new way of doing it. You don't have to show up. You're missing out on the blessing of worshiping with your church family. I would encourage you to not follow a teacher that talks so flippantly that way. You need to avoid those who brag about their wealth. You need to avoid those that are oozing with pride and resentment because they didn't get what they felt coming to them. If you're in that category as someone who's not a false teacher, the answer is simple, repent. Repent and realize Jesus is better. Do worship his way. Jesus is better than wealth and possessions. He'll give you what you need. Seek first his kingdom and he'll add to you what you need in your life. And Jesus is better. Glorifying him is better than glorifying yourself. Third warning uh, we could take away together is that false teachers are a really da big danger, a very real danger to the undiscerning. To those that aren't listening through a filter, those that aren't going home and looking in their Bible, it's like, hey, what he said didn't sound right. I should check that out. In fact, I had a pastor, when I first became a youth pastor, he always said this, and it kind of made me laugh because I didn't understand it. He said, you could ruin a lot of good preaching if you know your Bible. There's a lot of stuff people say that everyone's like, oh, that's amazing. And then you're like, yeah, it's not real. There's one time I was, I woke up in the morning and I, I learned this that Christmas in my first church. I was living alone, turned on the TV, saw this guy, didn't know who he was. He had this really compelling accent, realized it was Benny Hinn. And I'm listening and I'm like, wow, that sounds... 
that's, that sounds crazy on the mark. And then I open my Bible, it's like, that's not what it says. I've never even studied this, and I know that's not what it says. But, but to illustrate this danger, Jude makes metaphors out of these naturally occurring phenomenon. And they're in nature. So the first thing he says, he says, they're hidden reeves at your love feast. Well, what are reeves? Well, you know, think like iceberg, except they're not iceberg. It's, it's that coral that forms along the shore. It's kind of shallow, can rip out the hull of a ship. And you don't even see it. By the time you know it's there, your boat is underwater. And so he said, look, these false teachers, they're, uh, they're an unseen danger, and they're eating uh, confidently at, at your love festivals. The, the time you're supposed to get together to celebrate God's goodness, to learn the word of God, to take communion, they're hanging out without any fear because nobody knows that they're there. And, and instead of being shepherds that love the people, that feed the flock, they're actually feeding themselves. He calls them waterless clouds swept along by winds. You ever see like a dark sky and you're like, man, it's going to rain today. And it's dark for a long time. It's like, okay, where's the rain? My grass is brown. Where's the rain? Especially if you live in Ohio. You're like, I had a nice yard a month ago. Where in the world is the rain? Well, they're like, these prophets are like clouds threatening rain, meaning they, they make all these promises that never come true. Here's how one commentator put it. He says, apostate teachers promise to bring the true spiritual blessing and refreshment from God, but they never deliver. Jude likened them to clouds carried along by the winds, constantly pretending to rain, but failing to produce it. So false teachers often let people down. He calls them fruitless trees in late autumn. What does a farmer do with a fruitless tree? He digs it up. He's like, I, I can't use this. There's nothing good coming from this tree. Calls them wild waves of sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. You ever go to the beach? Anyone love the beach? Go to the beach in a few months. Love the water, love the sand, hate that foam on top. It just it gets kind of nasty. Or if there's a shipwreck or there's a storm, all this debris comes in. You look at the beach, you're like, I don't want to be at that beach. I want to be at North Carolina Beach. But waves, they rage back and forth. They produce nothing of substance when that foam comes on shore. All they do is produce shame. When someone gets sucked into a false teacher and then it, the, the veils rip back, it, it often devastates them to the point where they're very leery to try another church. The last thing he calls them is wandering stars. It's like, oh, that's cool. We're all wandering. We're kind of seeking our own way. Heard these phrases like faith is a journey. Yeah, it, it can be. But a, but a star to a ship captain, if it was fixed in the sky, it gave them direction. They often navigated uh, their, their journey through the stars. But wandering stars like a shooting star. It's useless. It flashes bright. It burns out. And it says that the, by their burning out for eternity, it, it demonstrates that eternal judgment is a sure thing for them. So to someone trying to navigate life, a false teacher is as useless as a navigator on a ship trying to guide their way by a shooting star. So what do we learn from this? Promise without performance is useless. Now when we say that, we're not talking about do they do a really good job at all the, the, the things that they're supposed to do, like their duties. But are they living out their faith in a way that proves that they, they believe what they say? Are they consistent? So here's what we need to do. We need to watch out as we see that new next teacher that we don't get sucked in the style. We don't get obsessed with the strategy. And we don't choose them over those that are committed to the truth. It doesn't matter how slick their production is or how smooth they talk if they are full of lies. Lastly, when we get to verses 14 through 16, we come to understand that the destruction of false teachers, it's a sure thing. It's a done deal. God is going to destroy them. So he makes this reference back to Enoch, the man who walked with God. It says in Genesis that Enoch walked with God and was no more. It was like he walked so closely with God, he said, all right, God, time for me to go home. It's almost like God said, come to my home, it's closer. And then Enoch went to the afterlife. But it says in verse 14, it says, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his holy ones. Now, the way he is writing that, Jude talking about Enoch's prophecy, it's like it's a done deal. It's like it's happening right now. Like, like you know, like if the building was on fire, it's like, behold, the fire department is coming, you know, because the alarm's going off. He's letting them know that, that it's already taking place. They are doomed to be destroyed. 
And then in verse 15, uh, it says, they, ex- they come to execute judgment on all and to convict them of all the ungodly, of their deeds and ungodliness they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Then in verse 16, it elaborates on the ungodly things they have spoken. It says, these are grumblers. Same word used against Israel when they complained against God after he saved them. Malcontents, they're discontent with the promises of God, discontent with their life. They're following their own sinful desires and they are loud mouth boasters. In other words, they brag a lot. And because of the sins of their mouth, God will destroy them. So we know what's gonna happen to false teachers. We know what's gonna happen to those that continue in the way uh, of teaching the Bible the right way. God's gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant. We also know that if you continue following the pattern of faith that we talked about last week, God will look at you uh, when you meet him face to face and say, well done and good and faithful servant. So we, we know the eternal destiny of false teachers. But here's the question. What's your destiny? What's your destiny this morning? See, one of the reasons we, we want to warn you what's out there is because we're very concerned as elders and leaders of this church that you first and foremost believe the gospel. That you've come to a place, uh, not, not, I've heard all this stuff, you gotta realize God loves you as you are. No, God does not love you as you are. God found you in your sin and said, I love you enough not to leave you that way. And because he found you in your sin, he said, I got a plan for this, I sent Jesus And Jesus went to the cross after living a holy life. Jesus kept every moral law that God gave. He kept them perfectly. See, it's not just enough to have a clean slate. You also have to have the righteousness, the goodness, the the, the law keeping that Jesus got done that no one else could do because if all your sin is wiped away, all all the laws that you broke, there's still what's called the sin of omission, the good that you should have done that you didn't do. Jesus did that for you. You get credit for what you don't deserve if you follow Jesus. Because Jesus took your sin to the cross. It was nailed to the cross with him and your sin died with Jesus on the cross so that your penalty, what you owe God for the evil that you've done. And listen, you and I, we have done a lot of evil, evil that we don't even think about. Sin that we become comfortable with, that's just a part of our daily lives. We don't even think about the, the mistruths that we can speak without thinking clearly. The things that we tolerate on the, the TV set that dishonor God that maybe we're not thinking through. The YouTube videos, the music. There are times that we are dishonoring God and we don't even realize it. And what God said was, I love you enough not to leave you there. I got a plan for you. Follow me. Let me be your king. Let me be your leader. And do it my way. That's what God has called us to. And some of you have done that. You said, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my king. Please forgive my sin. Help me to live for you. And then what happens is this miracle, God's spirit lives within you, gives you a new heart, and you start to desire pleasing God more than pleasing yourself. You start to desire doing good more than doing evil. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. And the journey doesn't stop there. In fact, if it does stop there, there's a question, are you really saved? Did you just want to get out of punishment or do you really love Jesus? Because think about this. A lot of people think they're saved because they're like, I want to go to heaven. It's like, who doesn't? Did you hear about the other place? It's not like the cartoons or the comic strips where where the biggest problem there is heat and cold coffee. Larson tries to make it, you know, make a joke out of it, but, but hell's hot forever is a long time. And if you don't repent, you get punished for your sin, for the evil that you did do. You get the punishment that you deserve. But for a Christian, you get credit for the good you didn't do because you received Jesus' righteousness as he took your sin, and you also avoid the punishment you did deserve. That's called God's mercy. So the question is, where are you? We know that false teachers will be destroyed. What is your destiny? This morning, one of the reasons I, I don't, get excited about altar calls because sometimes people respond in the motion. I, I, I've been in youth events where they just beat down these students until they're crying and, and I'm like dealing with a kid. It's like, we've been reading the Bible together. He loves Jesus he's certain, and he's like crying and I'm like, he's like, I'm just, I'm like, shut up, go sit down. You're fine. You love Jesus. It's good. Don't let this person manipulate you. 
But if you are a person who this morning would want to say, Jesus, I want you to be king. I need your forgiveness. I'd love to talk with you after church. I'll just be floating around. I'd love to put some resources in your hands and tell you what the next steps are that you can take. Because we love you. We want you to know the truth. And our prayer is that you will choose to follow Jesus. And that can only happen if you sense this pull. And if you feel the pull this morning, don't resist. At least have a conversation with us before you leave. We're so glad to have you here with us. Thanks for joining us this week. Be blessed. Bridge your scent.